Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. So today I'm going to be explaining to you genetic entropy and importantly, it's fatal flaws. Uh, I've divided these flaws up into three categories. Uh, fundamental flaws, these are flaws at the very foundation of the premise itself. Uh, mathematical flaws, where we're going to talk about the mathematical reasoning behind genetic entropy and why it ultimately fails. Um, and then finally, mechanistic flaws, where we're going to show that when you actually apply an empirical distribution of fitness effects to population genetic individual-based simulations, that genetic entropy is not at all predictive of the dynamics of that population. Um, this idea, of course, was put forward by John Sanford, um, pictured here, and we're going to talk a little bit about how he defines it. But first, I want to just say that my inspiration for this video was due to a podcast debate last night between Donnie at Standing for Truth uh, and Taylor Snake Was Right, in which they debated the question, is genetic entropy a legitimate problem for evolution? Um it's a pretty fun podcast. I suggest checking it out. I, I dropped it in the description box below. Um, so if you want to know a little bit more about the impetus, the inspiration, if you will, for this video, um, check that out. So what I want to do here is instead of like straw manning the definition of genetic entropy, I'm going to let John Sanford himself describe it to us. Um, and this is from his website, geneticentropy.org, um, and from the page, what is genetic entropy? I'm not going to read all of this, but I do want to kind of walk you through because I think it importantly sets up the discussion. Um, so first, what is genetic entropy? It is the genetic degeneration of living things. Genetic entropy is the systematic breakdown of the internal biological information systems. Uh, it results from genetic mutations, which are typographical errors in the programming of life or life's instruction manual. Um, so this is a pretty important uh, analogy that he's drawing here that I'm going to be using throughout to just kind of drive home why this analogy actually consistently fails um, genetic entropy. So you can imagine um, some original genome that was like a book. Right, And that over time, their argument is that any mutation is a typographical error in this book. So if you're copying this book, every generation, there is some error that's scrambling a word, a sentence, a paragraph. And then over time, the information of the book, right, whatever the story or uh, content of the book gets degraded over time until eventually – it no longer is, you know, it's like a completely nonsensical and the population goes extinct. Um, he then goes into uh, this like idea about genetic entropy at the personal level, which is really weird to me. It's it's actually like kind of conflating individual senescence with population uh, like genetic load, which is not at all the same thing. Like the processes that cause individual level senescence is not at all the same processes that cause like genetic load in population. So I, I don't really know why he he draws that analogy. We're going to skip that paragraph. Um, genetic entropy that affects us as a population, because mutations arise in our cells, uh, we pass many of our new mutations to our children. So mutations continuously accumulate in the population, with each generation being more mutant than the last. Again, remember, going back to the book analogy, you have an original book, and each generation, the mutants are the, the degrading... Uh, the original content of the book, right? So not only do we undergo genetic degeneration personally, we also are undergoing genetic de gen degeneration as a population. This is essentially evolution going the wrong way. And importantly, he, he claims natural selection can slow down but cannot stop genetic entropy on the population level. So there, there is his definition of genetic entropy. It's the idea that there was once an original book, an original genome that over time has accumulated typographical errors or mutations that are eroding the meaning of the, of the original content, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about first why there are some fundamental flaws in this line of reasoning and even proposing this question what are the biological and population genetic flaws that they are making? So the first flaw is that there was no original genome or book or document that was free of mutations, right? That that, that analogy itself falls flat on its face, and it's very easy to demonstrate this. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a study from the nine-spine stickleback pictured here, um, and on this bottom panel, the C panel, 
On the x-axis is the genomic position, and then on the y-axis is the time to the most recent common ancestor. As you scan across the genome, notice that there is virtually no shared ancestor across each genomic position, that the time to that ancestor varies, right? It, it hops up and down. What this varying represents is that there are different ancestors all across a genome, not just in the nine spine stickle, stickleback. This is also true in humans and every other eukaryotic organism that has recombination, right? Because recombination is shuffling around your pedigree such that individuals do not have the exact same ancestor all across their genome. What genetic entropy proposes is that, is that there was one original book. Right? So that means that all across your genome, there should be some one original haplotype, one original book that represents the ancestor of every position in your genome, and that anything that has deviated from that is a mutation since that original book was, in their perspective, created. Right, But look, there is no one ancestor. What that means is that every single one of these coalescent events at other locations in the genome, there were mutations. There were individuals that were existing with mutations. So no individual at any one of these locations were free from mutations. There were always mutations existing across the genome because there is no one original genome. This fundamentally undermines that concept, and it is very, very easy to demonstrate. So that's fundamental flaw number one. Number two, mutations are not always bad. They have a distribution of fitness effects. Some are bad, some are neutral, and some are good. Again, this has been shown experimentally. So I'm going to show you two different ways in which we can evaluate the distribution of fitness effects. The first is called mutation induction experiments or inducing mutations onto the population itself. This is very targeted, and the reason that that Researchers often do this is because then you don't have to wait on them to occur naturally, right? You can just force a mutation to occur, and then you can measure how it uh, impacts the fitness of the organism. So this is a study, the distribution of fitness effects caused by single nucleotide substitutions and an RNA virus. What they did is they took an RNA virus, and they randomly picked locations across the genome, and they just mutated them. They caused specific changes all across the genome, and then they said, how does that change impact the fitness of the organism, right? Um, and doing it this way, they can directly measure it without having to wait, again, like I said, on mutations to occur. And this is their distribution of fitness effects. So on the x-axis is measured fitness, with one being neutral, Everything less than one is deleterious, greater than one is beneficial. And as you can see, there are clearly mutations that they could induce that increased the fitness of the virus. The virus replicated faster when they induced certain specific mutations. Now, there were plenty of mutations that when they induced harmed the virus, caused the virus to have reduced fitness, right? But there were still mutations that could be induced that would increase the fitness of the virus. Therefore, mutations are not always bad. A second way in which researchers have done this is what are called mutation accumulation experiments. These are perhaps the most misunderstood among creationists, and so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how they work. So creationists will often point to these kinds of studies and say, okay, there were beneficial mutations, but the population fitness declined without really understanding how these experiments work in the first place. So what we do in a mutation accumulation experiment is you take an ancestral population that has some distribution of fitness effects. That's shown in panel B. You can see a very tight distribution here around neutrality with very slightly deleterious and very slightly beneficial, right? Very tight distribution. Now that ancestral population, what you want to do is take individuals from it, inbreed them so that there is no variation across their genome, and then you want to allow the new inbred population to evolve. You do this because you want to be able to like recognize new mutations. You need to, to be able to tell the difference between de novo mutations and mutations that were ancestrally present, right? Because that's the way you can measure their effects.
And so you highly inbreed them and then you let them evolve. This also has the benefit and that in wild populations, selection is very strong. And so any deleterious mutation that arises gets immediately wiped out before you can identify it. Now, in a mutation accumulation experiment, when you want to get the actual distribution of de novo mutations, you want those bad mutations to appear. You want them to be able to rise in frequency so that you can detect them and actually calculate the true empirical distribution, right? So what that leads to is a population with decreasing fitness over time because selection is inefficient in these highly inbred bottlenecked populations. Right. So that's absolutely what we expect to see. And we need that to happen so that we can see the highly deleterious variant. So up here, this is after they've inbred this population and then they let it evolve and they calculate the frequency. So you can see you have a lot more of these strongly deleterious variants in this inbred population that you didn't see ancestrally because selection was too strong and removed them. So now you get a more realistic view of what the, what the mutation pressure is in a population. However, notice importantly that there are still beneficial mutations. And in fact, there are some that were even more beneficial than, they, than what appeared ancestrally. Uh, and so what this study concluded is that there were more beneficial mutations following a mutation accumulation experiment than what they expected, just even based on the ancestral distribution of fitness effects. Again, demonstrating very clearly that beneficial mutations absolutely occur. Uh, lastly, this is from the Linsky long-term evolution experiment in which they also allow mutations to accumulate. On the top here is showing fitness ancestrally, uh, the distribution of fitness effects ancestrally in black after 2,000 generations of growing on um, a glucose limited medium in blue, and then after 15,000 generations in red. And what you can see is that the distribution of fitness effects changes over time as the population is evolving to this new medium, right? There are fewer beneficial mutations because the ones that were beneficial ancestrally have become fixed, right? They, be, they have become fixed, and now the more mutations that occur are actually more deleterious because they, they've already evolved to the new habitat. So that's why the distribution of fitness effects is actually getting tighter over time. So you can see the red and the blue are moving away from the black here because they're getting tighter. Again, all of these are beneficial. These are deleterious. An important claim of genetic entropy is that effectively this can't happen, that selection shouldn't be able to differentiate between a lot of the mildly deleterious variants and the mildly beneficial ones. So if you look down here, we can see that selection can, act can absolutely differentiate between these. So in gray is the neutral ones, blue are the beneficial, and then red are the whole distribution of negative. This is just the, the DFE put against genomic position. And when we compare this against the, the per generation allelic change in frequency uh, with zero being no change, above zero being, you know, it's increasing in frequency and then below it's decreasing in frequency. Notice how the neutral ones basically stay around zero. That's because drift is dictating their frequency and drift is very slow. Whereas selection is driving the beneficial ones to increase in frequency and the deleterious ones, even the very mildly deleterious, as you can see here, are decreasing in frequency. According to genetic entropy, this can't happen. And yet here it is, empirically estimated in a laboratory population. So fu second fundamental flaw is that mutations are always bad, when in reality, mutations have a distribution of fitness effects that always include beneficial ones, even when they've undergone strong inbreeding and population bottlenecks that should, under the concepts of genetic entropy, prevent a population from increasing its fitness. Um, last, another fundamental flaw is that if all mutations are bad, that's, you know, the claim, they're all typographical errors and they're degrading the book, why is high genetic diversity a sign of a healthy population? So over here, I'm showing you the, the correlation between uh, populations of least conservation concern and those of most conservation concern. In the gray bars, and this is for birds, mammals, and reptiles, in the gray bars here, this is um, high genetic diversity, uh, and this is, well, th these are just measures of genetic diversity, 
with the least concern being significantly greater in terms of genetic diversity than the most concern, right? So in the in the podcast debate between Donnie and Taylor, Donnie used the term multiply mutant. He suggested that over time, the population becomes multiply mutant. There are more mutants in the population. Another way of saying that is genetically diverse. Those words are synonymous. Mutant just happens to have some like cultural connotation to it. It seems bad when you call something a mutant, but when you just say genetically diverse, it seems good. But those two words are synonymous. They mean exactly the same thing, right? And in a conservation setting, we can very clearly see that when a population has more genetic diversity, it is of least conservation concern compared to those with much less genetic diversity. Therefore, genetic diversity or being multiply mutant is actually a sign of a healthy population, not a bad one. To get a grip on this, this was a simulation study that compared genetic diversity on the x-axis with the drift load on the y-axis. And this drift load you can think about as the proportion of deleterious variants that are at high frequency in the population, that are actually depressing the fitness of the population. When the population has low genetic diversity, it has very high drift load. When the population has high genetic diversity, its drift load is much lower. This is the exact opposite pattern that genetic entropy predicts. Low genetic diversity means that you have less mutant individuals. Less mutant individuals should therefore have fewer deleterious variants. You should have a let, smaller drift load than what you have when there's a lot of mutants. Again, conservation genetics fundamentally rejects this concept, and we have seen this both empirically showing like the populations of conservation concern, as well as here with the simulation study showing that genetic diversity is negatively correlated with drift load, not positively. Now, this is a really cool study that I think adds a little bit of nuance to this idea um, and that will allow us to maybe get a, a little bit of a better grasp on genetic load as it's understood in a population genetic context. So I'm going to take this opportunity to try to teach you a little bit of pop gen. So sorry, I'm sneaking this in on you. Um, so this was a cool study about the Montezuma quail. Uh, it's a very cute little bird that's widely distributed across uh, West Texas, Northern Mexico, Arizona, and and. Um, and all over, all down the Sierra Madre um, Occidental. So on the left here, oh well, I should say there are two distinct populations. There's the population in Arizona that is much much bigger. It has not undergone a bottleneck. It's a it's a very healthy population. And then there's one in West Texas. The West Texas population is highly fragmented. Very few individuals left um, of high conservation concern. And what they wanted to do is compare the Arizona population that is considered to be healthy with the West Texas population that is considered to be highly um, inbred and genetically depauperate. Okay, And so let's look at these two different graphs that kind of show alternating patterns. Um, and then we're going to dig into the pop gen of how this works. So on the y-axis, so let's start with this panel. On the y-axis are the number of SNPs. So this is the amount of genetic variation. Um, and then across the um, x-axis are whether that variation is deleterious, whether it's deleterious but it's tolerated, and then whether it's non-synonymous. All of these are basically considered to be bad. Right? These, are, these are bad mutants um, that you don't want in your population, right? Each, each one of these, they're just difference in like the, the distribution of fitness effects, but they're effectively showing the same thing, okay? Um, notice that in pink, this is the Arizona population, and in blue is the West Texas one. This shows a very interesting pattern, that the amount of deleterious variation is higher in the bigger population than in the smaller population. Now, that seems quite curious, right? Why is it that the larger population has more deleterious variation than the small one? Well, remember, bigger populations just have more variation. There's more individuals upon which a mutation can act, and therefore, they're going to have more variation. But importantly, that variation should exist at low frequency, and it should very rarely be expressed in the homozygous state, right? Whereas if selection is much more, much less efficient, that deleterious variation should be more often present at high frequency 
and in the homozygous state. So let's compare it then to panel D that is showing the number of derived homozygous SNPs. So this is that variation flipped around, not just looking at whether or not there is variation, which is the first panel. The second one asks, is that variation present in the homozygous state? That is to say, is it actually expressed? And we see the opposite pattern. The West Texas has significantly more homozygous variation than the Arizona population. So these are showing two different things. One, the genetic variation is greater in larger populations and that they will harbor more deleterious variation, but they do it at low frequency and it's almost always in the heterozygous state and it's hidden from selection. However, in small populations, that de same deleterious variation is at high frequency because selection is weaker and it's being expressed. It's actually causing the population uh, to, to experience that deleterious variation because it's in the homozygous state. Um, and this is really important in thinking about like human population genetics, right? So let's let's compare this just for a second to what you might would expect in humans, um, and we will try to relate it back to genetic entropy. So remember, humans ancestrally have very small population sizes, right? We have our long-term effective sizes only like 10,000. What this means is that we expect that there were, would have been a lot of, of deleterious variation that would have been segregating ancestrally in humans, right? So we would have been more akin to the West Texas variant, uh, the more the West Texas population of quail, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago. However, one of the things that genetic entropy constantly points to is that, oh, look, there is more deleterious variation popping up all the time. Well, remember, the human population is expanding exponentially. We've gone from 10,000 individuals some, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 years ago to over 7 billion today. There are far more individuals upon which deleterious mutations can occur in the first place. We absolutely expect to see more deleterious variants in a bigger population. That's what this study clearly shows. It's just that when that variation occurs, it should be rare and it should be almost always in the heterozygous state. So we should very we should not see many individuals actually suffering from the from this disease because it's kept at very very low frequency. And this is exactly what we see in humans. The genetic diseases that the that creationists often point at as evidence of genetic entropy are diseases at incredibly low frequencies, which is what you would expect if genetic load is low. If genetic load is high, then what you should see is that those deleterious variants should be at higher frequency and should be in the homozygous state more often than not. And that pattern we do not see. So I just thought this was a pretty cool thing to show you, just to give you a little bit of nuance into how population genetic theory understands um, both where deleterious variation comes from and when that deleterious variation actually matters. Okay, so the last fundamental flaw is that there is just no evidence that populations are uniformly losing fitness. This is a claim that genetic entropy has to back up. If, if genetic entropy is uniform and natural selection can't prevent it from happening, all populations should be uniformly losing fitness, and they just aren't. So this is a study that I did uh, in grad school on Hosteriid amphipods, this cute little guy pictured here, and I reconstructed their ancestral population sizes through time. You can think of this as a proxy for, uh, for fitness because a population can't be growing in size and, increase, and decreasing its fitness. Those two things are like literally contradictory, right? Like if a population is losing fitness, it must be decreasing in size. Uh, and so... All three of these different species, what I'm showing is this is the time in the past, this is going forward in the present, and uniformly all of them have seen population size increases into the present day. I mean, this is a lot of a lot because like new niches have been opened up along the Gulf of Mexico, and so they're actually like colonizing new areas and they're growing in size, right? Um, and this is very very similar again to what we see in humans. Human population sizes are growing. We've been growing exponentially for decades, centuries. If that's true, then we can't also be losing fitness. 
if our fitness is declining, we should not be growing in size. That th Those two things are contradictory and can't both be true. Okay, now we've laid in the groundwork for the, the foundational and fundamental flaws of genetic entropy. I now want to introduce a bit of a mathematical flaw. Um, and we're going to be doing this by talking about uh, fitness equilibrium. So the idea that a population is not shrinking or growing in size means that that population is staying constant at an equilibrium fitness value. Um, and then now let's consider two different states that any given allele might be in. It could be in state A, which is lower fitness, shown here, or it can be in state B, which is higher fitness, okay? And the transition between state B and state A is whether or not that mutation is beneficial or deleterious. So a transition from state A to state B is beneficial, from state B to state A is deleterious. So now that we've laid that out, let's talk a little bit about how we can use the idea of fitness equilibrium to actually predict what kinds of mutation rates should exist between deleterious and beneficial. So first we need to note that beneficial mutations always fix faster than deleterious ones. The reason for this is that deleterious mutations cannot fix faster than just neutral ones, right? They fix at the same rate as neutral ones because they fix solely because of drift. Beneficial mutations fix because of selection, so we'll always fix faster. So that leads to this inequality, where this is the substitution rate from B to A, so from B to A going down, that's deleterious fixation, is always less than going from A to B, because this is being driven by selection, this is being driven by drift, drift is always slower. Okay, so we're starting off with, with that piece of logic. Next, at equilibrium, so just an equilibrium population uh, at, that exists as a balance between states A and B, then the probability of being in state A multiplied by the fixation by the fixation rate from A to B must be equal to the probability of being in state B here multiplied by the fixation probability of B to A. Okay, so this, this equivalency must be true for a fitness equilibrium to be maintained. Now, importantly, we can use a little bit of mathematical logic here and note that this implies that the probability of being in state B must be greater than the probability of being in state A. The reason that we know this is because since this inequality is true, right, that A to B is greater than B to A, for these two things to be equal, and A to B, right, this is what's greater than B to A, if P to A is greater than P to B, then this, then this equality is no longer true, right? For this equality to be true, the probability of being in state B has to be greater than the probability of being in state A because of this inequality. Hopefully you're following me here. Um, so because of because this equality must exist if a fitness equilibrium is going to be maintained, therefore um, compensating for in the increased beneficial rate, but we find that this is reversed for the mutation rate. So now let's consider instead of the fixation rate, let's think about it in the mutation rate. The mutation rates here are the rate of change from A to B. So this is this actual change from A to B. And then the, the compound mutation rate between B to A. So again, we're going from B to A. So this is no longer a substitution rate like it was before. This is just the rate of mutation, okay? Now, remembering that since the probability of being in state B is greater than the probability of being in state A, then the mutation rate from A to B must be less than the mutation rate between B and to A. What that means is that the B to A mutation, which remember is deleterious by definition, is always greater than the beneficial rate from A to B. If it wasn't, you would no longer be at a fitness equilibrium. You would actually be growing in population size, right? So therefore, just to maintain fitness equilibrium, to maintain a constant size, the deleterious mutation rate must be greater than the beneficial mutation rate. You should always see more deleterious mutations than you see beneficial ones. So even if beneficial mutations are exceptionally rare and deleterious mutations are far more common to be, to, you can still maintain a constant size because of these, this very simple mathematical 
logic. Finally, let's talk about the mechanistic flaws. So these are the flaws in how the mechanism itself works. Um, and to answer this, we're just going to do some simulation. So simulations of genetic entropy by Sanford and friends assume that there are no beneficial mutations. And as I've already shown you, this does not reflect empirically estimated distribution of fitness effects um, and is therefore unnecessarily restrictive. So what I did is I set up some simulations with an actual distribution of fitness effects that is more reflective of empirical systems. That is to say, it has beneficial mutations. But notice I'm being very, very conservative. So up here is my simulated DFE, and down here is the empirical. Uh, this is the deleterious ones. It's negative exponential. You can see most of it falls around near neutrality with a long tail. This is pretty similar to what you're seeing here, most near neutrality with a long tail. Um, but then look at the beneficial. Very, very few, all very closely centered around zero. And if you zoom in, you can see a tiny little tail right there. This is much fewer and a much lower beneficial effect than even what we see and the empirical data. So I'm being very conservative with what the effect of a beneficial mutation actually is. Next, I am the population size uh, is going to fluctuate because you want a population to be able to go extinct whenever you're doing these genetic entropy uh, simulations. So you're not setting a population size. Instead, you're setting um, sort of an environmental fitness. So what can a population actually, what, what can the environment actually maintain in terms of the number of individuals? So there's some amount of resources that individuals can exhaust, and it can only support X number of individuals. So this is called the carrying capacity, okay? And I'm setting the carrying capacity at 1,000. This is a very small population, Right. This is a population that drift can absolutely dominate in and as well, like in, in an empirical system, a thousand would be small enough you would be concerned for. OK, so again, a very conservative population size. Next, I'm setting a very high mutation rate. So one e to the negative seven, that's a lot of mutations. That's more mutations. That's a faster rate than what we see for most vertebrates. And I'm setting a fairly low recombination rate. Next, let's look at the mutation distribution. So 49% of them are neutral. That's just truly neutral. That's here. You can see all of these fall right along neutrality and that that's, that's a high distribution of numbers that are at neutrality. So I think this is fairly justified from the empirical DFEs. 50% um, of them are deleterious. There's clearly a good number here that falls along the deleterious variant. You can see a lot of them fall along the deleterious. So 50% deleterious, 49% are neutral. So 99% either have no fitness effect or have negative fitness effect, okay? 1% of all possible mutations are beneficial. Only 1%. And they're beneficial, and when they're beneficial, their effect is very, very small, right? So a very, very small beneficial effect here, all right? Very few are beneficial, very small effect when they do occur. I ran this for 50,000 generations. That's more than what like has been expected for humans to exist. Like according to creationists, we haven't even been around for 50,000 generations. Um, more than enough time for genetic entropy to be acting, right? 50,000 generations is quite a long time. Um, so I let it run for that amount of time and let's see what happened. Um, okay, so up top here, these are the counts of the mutations, both fixed and polymorphic, 2,000 plus of which were completely neutral, 450 are deleterious, segregating or fixed, and 75 are beneficial. You can see over here in the population size, we start off at generation zero, and you can actually see there's a little bit of a dip in size. Um, but then the population starts, and here we're just getting a lot of deleterious mutations, so it starts to drag the population down. But then we start getting some beneficial ones, and it starts compensating, and it starts picking the population back up, and then before you know it, it starts growing. It grows, and then it starts to kind of equilibrate, and then we get some more, and then it finally kind of reaches an equilibrium value around 30,000 generations and around 1,200 individuals. What that means is that our population actually grew by 200 individuals more than what the environment supposedly could even maintain. Right. And it did this because despite the fact that there were very, very 
low chance of getting a beneficial mutation, they were more than capable of compensating for the very high rate of deleterious mutations. Um, and you can see this is the action of selection right here, driving away those deleterious mutations. So this is the ratio of deleterious over neutral if selection was incapable of removing the vast majority of deleterious mutations because they are effectively neutral, remember, um, then we shouldn't be able to see this negative decline. And yet, as the deleterious mutation started to accumulate and get more and more, selection became more obvious, uh, or they became more obvious to selection, and it drove that frequency down. So you can see that ratio is just plummeting as we get further and further towards the end of the simulation. Therefore, despite the strong preference for deleterious mutations, the population persisted and indeed grew by 200 individuals. How can this be? It's because most deleterious mutations don't fix. They are just lost. They are either lost by drift or they are lost because selection removes them. Um, and those that do can be compensated for by subsequent beneficial mutations. And this goes back to the mathematical logic and the mathematical flaws to genetic entropy that I was talking about previously, is that Deleterious mutations occur less often. The deleterious mutate or beneficial mutations occur less often because the deleterious rate is greater, but when they occur, they fix faster, right? So you're waiting a long time for all of these deleterious mutations to even accumulate at all, whereas a single beneficial mutation and all of that noise will rapidly rise to fixation and compensate for the deleterious ones that are segregating. That's effectively what we have shown in this simulation and what we showed mathematically previously. To me, these three fundamental flaws, the fundamental flaws, the mathematical flaws, and the mechanistic ones are ultimately fatal to the concept of genetic entropy. Genetic entropy relies on the premise that there is some original genome that mutations are degrading that will cause extinction. We showed that that idea is completely flawed. There is no original genome. There is not one ancestor across your genome. And because of this, all individuals at all times had mutations existing, right? There, there was no individual that was the original book, was the original progenitor of all descendants that had no mutations. Uh, genetic entropy's assumptions represent fundamental misunderstandings of genomics and population genetics. This goes back to the idea that multiply mutant individuals is somehow different than genetic diversity, right? And genetic diversity is an ideal thing in conservation genetics. You want your population to be diverse because then it can respond to environmental change, right? That some of that diversity when the environment changes, will turn out to be good and will help you overcome things like climate change or anthropogenic pressures. Like those are the sorts of things you want in a population. So by assuming the diversity and mute, that mutants are somehow bad completely undermines a basic premise of conservation genetics. Um, genetic entropy commits serious mathematical errors, failing to recognize that the deleterious mutation rates must be higher just to maintain fitness equilibrium. If deleterious mutations weren't higher, you would be incapable of maintaining equilibrium and the population would just explode in size. Finally, genetic entropy fails mechanistically. As soon as you actually apply an empirically derived DFE, one that we've observed and calculated in laboratories, when you apply those DFEs, the population can grow, will equilibrate, and will not decline. It does just fine when you actually use realistic population models that aren't straw men of how we think evolution and population genetics actually work. Um, so with that, I think we've pretty clearly demonstrated that genetic entropy is fatally flawed. It is ultimately a mathematical model with no math. It is a model that relies on simulations that are ill-formed, that don't actually represent any empirically observed DFE, and that it relies on the premise of some original genome that has decayed. There is no evidence that such a thing ever existed and that mutants and diversity are somehow different, with diversity being good and mutants being bad, when in reality, those terms are synonymous. So thanks so much for being here. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. This is a really cool topic to me. I would uh, love to talk about it further, um, and I will catch you next time. Thanks.